Today we have an absolutely massive update to do on the Piranha Aquarium. From adding fish to the tank that no one believes that I did, but I'll prove it, and then of course, what actually ended up happening to them, to showing you who's the real boss of this tank, and that's likely going to shock you and bring up an interesting debate and make you wonder or even look at Piranha differently. I also need to show you a small change I made to the tank that I wasn't expecting to cause so many issues. Then a special segment's going to be implementing your suggestions to solve an issue that this tank had and what the results were, followed by how I will in fact solve it. Then I have a special segment where I implemented your suggestions to solve a problem that the tank has and what the results were from it. Finally, what's next for the tank and how I'm going to do it. Now you guys are of course going to remember that we already added in about 120 of these red-eyed tetras. Many of you think that they're all gone and in fact they're not. The tank has just become so cloudy from the piranha stirring up the planted tank soil that it's sometimes hard to for the camera to focus on them but a lot of the times they spend all their time in the back and or behind those roots or branches. Like you, could, you can kind of see them. <laughs> well I can see them. It's much different on camera. I guess I, I suggest you guys can uh, guess that. But that's not the only fish that I added to the tank. I added other fish three months ago, but never told a single person. You guys will remember that I had like 20 or 30 bleeding heart tetras. I added them to this tank and they've been in there ever since. They simply hide behind the tree roots, rarely coming out. But although we can kind of see some now where they're kind of coming out here and there. It depends on when the lights come on. They come out in the dark. And they're most active at night because, of course, they're trying to avoid the predators. Although the piranhas simply do not eat them. I think the, the bleeding hearts are just a little bit more cautious as opposed to these, like, red eyes. So those fish were added and nobody knew. Nobody saw. But I often get asked, how is it possible that these tetras, these tiny little tetras, are able to survive with the piranha? And the answer is simple. We've answered it before. The piranha do not see them as a food source. Not only are they too small... But the energy they would it would require to capture them is just not worth the end result. That is, of course, unless one of the tetras reaches the end of its life, which a lot of the times is a very short period of time, maybe only one to five years, depending on the species. Uh, and then they just kind of, you know, fall to the ground and, and, and die. But that's when the piranha might eat it because they are more of a, show of, a, of a scavenger and an opportunistic feeder. Uh, and in the wild, they'll eat things like nuts and berries and uh, other dead animals and whatnot, but rarely do they go after something alive and healthy. The other thing you guys will remember is that there's two groups of piranha in here. They're both red belly piranha from South America, yet I didn't get them all at the same time. The bigger ones are from about almost two years ago when I got them, and then we got another group that was much smaller, and we ended up adding it to the tank. I was incredibly nervous about what would happen. You can kind of spot not only on the size difference, but some of them have the spots still on them from their uh, juvenile stages. And then the larger ones, the spots are almost entirely gone. And they're starting to get more of a sparkle and sheen and that red belly look that a lot of people really love. Personally, I love the look of an adult piranha. They're always shimmering in the tank. Uh, the, again, the camera may not capture it, but you see it in person. It just looks absolutely stunning. Anyways, I was worried the small ones were going to get eaten by the big ones. That simply did not happen. Not only were the uh, big ones accommodating of the little ones, but the little ones, here, look at them all up in a little group right now. The little ones are the bosses of the tank. They are the ones that truly run everything, and I'm absolutely fascinated as to why. So I thought I'd share my thoughts, or at least uh, my thesis on why I think this is happening. First and foremost, is it because they are from, you know, different parents? I guess when it comes to breeding, that will prove helpful so we can have a more varied uh, bloodline. Were their parents more aggressive than the other piranha's parents? going on over here a lot of them are hiding in the in the plants right now because i'm over here in a bright white sweater um so they'll hide in it in this little forest but is it because they're from different parents and just different aggression levels uh they do mix up though but not very rarely the the, the small ones are always the ones out always the first ones to eat always scare off the bigger guys just constantly every once in a while a big one will come along 
uh, and do something. But this one's actually missing a chunk in its mouth, likely because uh, one of the other piranha bit it while they were eating other food. They don't fight. They don't lip lock. These are not like cichlids. They're not incredibly territorial. Uh, they benefit off being in a group as opposed to uh, singular, so they know not to fight each other. But the other reason why I think the, the smaller guys are so much more dominant and so much more aggressive, because a lot of the times when you see a piranha tank, you see really big ones, they're very dormant, they just sit still, where smaller ones are why we think they're so exciting and fun. Is it because these guys are so much more desperate to grow? Because in the wild, only the strongest survive, and you need to get as big as you possibly can. Otherwise, well, you could be eaten. Man, they really love it back in that corner, don't they? You'll notice that they're not out as much anymore, and we're going to get to that in a second as to why I think that's happening. But anyways, back to the topic. Is it because of their age? Is it because of their size? Or is it because they came from different parents? Perhaps they were even collected from different localities in South America. What do you guys think it is? Identical species, but the bosses of the tank are the little ones, which is, in my opinion, in my experience with many types of fish, quite rare. A lot of the times, the biggest ones are the meanest. Absolutely interesting, especially when it comes to piranha. We get to learn so much here on this channel with them. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below. Look at this guy's little head poking out. See, they lay in the in, in the plants. Another one over here. They just sit in there. But that's why the cloud the tank is cloudy. Uh, underneath this, all of these plants is not is not a fine white sand. The fine white sand is only on the outside. On the inside is a planted tank substrate, humate. Uh, substrate, which essentially, if you get it wet and you and you kind of uh, wiggle it around in your fingers, it becomes a mud. It becomes a, a dust, and that's what's throughout the entire tank. To be fair, I should have capped the top of this with more sand. I just didn't have enough. Uh, and but also, we're looking at it in retrospect. I also didn't know that piranha like to hide in plants, so this is new. Um, and when you you know moving forward to cap the <laughs> cap the top, I usually never cap my soil. Um, and capping of, so of course, just means putting a small layer of your, uh, you know, your pretty soil on top of it just to stop that muddy soil from coming up. But I've never experienced uh, it, it getting messed up like this with piranha, especially. Uh, and I didn't cap it because I didn't know they were going to be in the plants so much. Uh, first and foremost. Second of all, I didn't plan on having any loaches or anything like that in the tank. So I just didn't bother, and, and I didn't plan on having any types of fish that would kind of stir it up or rip it up in any way whatsoever. Now you'll also notice that all the logs that were used to be in the front of here are removed. I took them out because, I'm going to be honest, I thought they were a bit of an eyesore. I'm starting to miss them now. But immediately after I removed them, these are hollowed, they are not real wood, um, you can't gravel vac or clean them out without removing them all, all the time. But believe it or not, every tiny little nook, every little crevice in your aquarium, the older it gets, the more it's going to collect detritus. Regardless of how many water changes you do, regardless of how clean you keep it, you will collect detritus. And when I was removing the logs, they were absolutely, completely <laughs> and utterly filled with mucky, mucky water. Just completely destroyed the look of the tank, which is fine. Quick water change, let the filter do its job for a couple of days, and it will, of course, go back to normal. Immediately after I start, I took those logs out, though, this is the look I was looking for. I wanted to kind of like this island, and you guys will remember, I just set up another planted tank with this exact kind of idea, and I think it was definitely inspired by this. But immediately, as soon as I did this, the piranha hide all the time now all the time. It's to the point where I'm thinking about adding the logs back in. However, do I do that or do I be more patient? Because I'm telling you right now, this is the look that I want. I want all of these plants and they're starting to call, come out. Look, they're shooting off these runners. And if you guys don't remember, these are all the same species of plant. Every single one of them are cryptocorin. And uh, I started by planting these type in here, but look at them, they came out through the rocks and they shoot off runners. So one plant will shoot off another plant. That plant will shoot off another plant. Underneath and in between is their roots. And it keeps happening, it keeps happening, it keeps happening. Until perhaps this entire area is filled with the only plant in this tank that has the capability of doing that, which is this one right here, which is the Cryptocorn parva. Absolutely stunning. Now. 
See how tall it gets here? Like, look, that's got to be six to eight inches tall, right? So imagine if that comes out all the way out here. We have beautiful green, but it's only about six to eight inches, and the rest are upwards of a foot. I think if we just leave it, leave it alone. To be fair, I probably shouldn't have took out the rocks, but these didn't start coming out like this. We had a couple here and there, but as soon as I took out all the rocks, these guys just started shooting out dramatically. Like this was within two weeks, all of it. Which, well, especially over here, this is a, a dramatic change. This is um, them growing incredibly fast. Now, when it does come to the water clarity, that doesn't impact the water quality. We still have good water quality. The fish are still doing great. The plants are still growing. But the clarity of it is, of course, it is such a, a nightmare to keep clear. Clarity, of course, can be fixed quite easily. And we're going to get to that. And I'll show you how I did that here shortly. But the next thing that I needed to tackle, and you guys know it, is my snail infestation. Why would I want to remove the snails in the first place? Obviously, snails turn over the substrate. They add to a more well-balanced ecosystem to your aquarium, kind of... Uh, finishing it off. They do eat all the uneaten food. They do eat the dead plants. They do a lot of beneficial things, but left unchecked. And we're looking at some serious issues. They add a massive amount of strain to the biological filtration system. They also, when the numbers increase far too much, just become incredibly unsightly. Now, if we have a massive die off of them all at once, that could cause a massive issue and detrimentally impact the piranha as well. So all I got to do is get them in check. The plants uh, did not have snails on them. The plants were in fact all tissue culture. Tissue culture meaning that these guys were uh, basically grown in a sterile environment, free from algae spores, free from parasites, pathogens, and of course, snails. So how did they come in here? Because the sand was new, the planted substrate was new, none of these rocks or, or wood had any snails on them. It was these uh, fake tree logs, the big ones in the back like that come all the way through. These used to be in the 2000 gallon, and I put plants in there that I did not bleach well enough um, or treat well enough at least. And they had snail eggs on them. I had a snail explosion in the 2000. I completely and utterly uh, eradicated that. But in this tank, it's going to be a lot different. Anyways, these were dry. These logs were dry for two months, I want to say. But the snail survived. And when I put them on here, boom, nice, uh, perfect environment for them. Within a month, I notice the snails, two months, three months, six months, just a snail explosion. It doesn't look that bad right now. In fact, it looks pretty good. That's because I've been cleaning it and whatnot. But uh, when the lights do go off, that's when they all come out. I was struggling with what to do. Of course, some people wanted me to add in some loaches or snail eating fish. I do not think they will survive in this tank. I do not think those tiny little fish... Uh, or those squiggly little spaghettis, you know, loaches and whatnot, or anything else that kind of eats snails will do well in this tank. I think they'll just get eaten. I also think they'll stir up the, the, the substrate more. I just don't want to add them. I just don't want snails in general. So the other option, of course, is dosing this tank with copper. Copper will kill the snails over time. I think that... Uh, I would have to manually remove and or do massive water changes for a few weeks because if you have a massive snail die off, that's a lot of organic material dying all at once. I'm going to have a huge ammonia spike. Not a problem, but the copper could potentially kill the plants. It also means that I'll never be able to have invertebrates in this tank, coral, nothing. This tank can never be much else than it is right now, which I don't plan on it. But I mean, 10, 15 years from now, when, you know, there is no more piranha, where the plants all die, who knows, right? I don't want to burn this tank type of deal, even though I'll just build another one or something along those lines. But so what's the other option? The other option is to manually remove. And I showed you guys do look at all the um, the the trail. The, all of the substrate has those are snail trails. The other option was to manually remove, and I showed you guys I was doing that manually, and then I started seeing you guys recommending different things, and I thought, you know what, I kind of know the uh, outcome, but I'm going to film a couple, uh, or at least one of these, showing you guys what to do, and one of the things I kind of want to point out is this tank is, uh, <clears throat> what, eight feet long, five feet front to back, uh, so it's, a it's about two and a half feet tall, 
but that means at eight feet long, five feet front to back, we're dealing with 40 square feet. To put that into perspective, a 55 gallon is four square feet of substrate. It is impractical to do a lot of the common things that you do to solve aquarium issues when you get into the big hundreds of gallons and large surface areas. <clears throat> so snail traps typically won't work. Uh, you're never going to stay on top of them. The other option, of course, is to add in food and manually remove it. I'll give it a shot. While I'm at it, I turn the lights off and the pump off just for a couple of hours, just to see if that gets them to come out a little faster. Apparently the snails will go after the potato, then I just remove the potato as I film with the potato. Let's see if it's working. All the snails are coming out and they're heading towards all of the potato slice. Wow, look how many snails there are. I thought they were almost gone. They're all going towards them though. Maybe I'll do this all night. <laughs> get it guys only one on a string i gotta get my arms wet for the rest hopefully this works but that's just not efficient enough if it was like a 55 gallon maybe a 100 gallon something like that i could i could solve the problem within a week but a 700 gallons 40 square feet is just not nearly as possible which is unfortunate now that doesn't mean that the suggestions don't work because they do I just don't know if they're going to be as practical on a much larger aquarium. With that said, here's what I'm going here's what I've been doing to keep a lot of this clean and how I'm capitalize on, capitalizing on uh, this tank recently. I'm going to continue with manual removal as well as starving them off, meaning I'm not going to feed the tank as much and uh, I'm going to manually remove as many as I can for as long as I can, uh, probably for two to three weeks. And then I'm going to do something extremely special that I think you guys will all agree to. First and foremost, manually removing them without having to do a water change, which means I can do this more often. I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a sifter that's, that has holes in it big enough for the sand to get through, but not the snails. Now watch this as I dig through an area that looks like it has no snails. Now look at that. It actually does have tons of snails in it. Now, of course, that does make a bit of a mess. It's going to cloud the tank up a little bit. That's fine. But every day I come out here and I sift through, look, even the bigger ones are starting to come out and they're running away from me. Now, once I dwindle the numbers down enough, we have to keep in mind, I don't want to add in loaches or any uh, anything else. Uh, I don't want to do chemical treatment. Manual removal is the biggest option for me, except many of you guys have uh, also recommended adding assassin snails. I don't think I could add enough assassin snails to combat the issue that I'm having. However, I bet you if I add 100 in then into this tank, uh, like 100 assassin snails into this tank in about a month after continuously doing what I wanna do with manually cleaning them, sifting it, starving them off, maybe even two weeks, then add in the assassin snails, I believe within a very short period of time, we'll only have 100 assassin t uh, snails. And that is essentially what I'm going to have to do with that tank. So that is the solution there. Now, is there anything else going to be happening with this tank? What are the future plans? To be honest, my future plans with this is just to feed the tank and enjoy it, do my water changes, sift the substrate every day, trying to remove as much snails as I can. Um, I'm, I clean these off or I crush a lot of them. Uh, I sift the sand, take out as many snails as I can, eventually add in the uh, assassin snails. But the filtration in this is about six years old at this point, and I just don't have the same faith in it as I did bef uh, before. You'll notice that the piranha are hiding. I do have to mess with this tank quite a bit. Every single day I gotta do this, and they hate it. Uh, so every once in a while, you'll just see a sooky little tail poking out, telling me he doesn't like it. Why are you doing this? Get out of my tank. Um, and then in a few hours, they'll come out. But uh, So I want to leave it alone. I want the plants to grow in. I just want this to get insane. And I think in about another six months, this tank is not going to look the same. It's just, it's, it's definitely one of my favorite rooms in the gallery for sure. 
Um, not only because it's just absolutely stunning to sit around. Of course, it's not that great right now. But, you know, once you do a massive cleaning of your tank, it's not going to be sparkly, crystal, crystal clear. A lot of things I got to work on with this tank. But to be fair, I don't mind having these types of issues. I don't mind troubleshooting. I don't mind fixing things. You have to do this stuff to gain experience. You have to learn a lot of the times with hands-on. But again, the filter's not enough. I am going to be building another one. So I've been avoiding showing up here for a little while, but you'll see these two inch pipes coming through the wall. On the other side of the wall, we have that filter I built. I still got to connect it. I think what I might do here is I might split this off. This filter is cycled. I value the cycling of it. I do not value its, uh, its mechanical uh, ability, meaning that it's not polishing the water. It's not removing the debris out of the water, but it is keeping the tank cycled. I think I'm going to put a T in it and dump it into there. I'm also going to run another pump, like from there, there's a pump that's behind the trees here. I'm going to put a pump behind the tree over there somewhere, uh, and it'll feed this. All I'm doing is lining it up right now. It seems low, but I can get under it and just duck a little bit. I don't care. Um, I just want this, get this up and running. And you guys remember the night and day effect of adding, uh, building these. So the filters that I built for the 2000, I have the identical idea here. And we look in and uh, this tank is always crystal clear at this point because it did have a massive um, canister filter on it that just was no longer doing a good job. Yeah, that's the future plans. Fil finish building the prod, fil finish building the filter, solve the snail issue, and just let the plants grow. Anyways, hope you enjoyed the video. And of course, my 700 gallon piranha aquarium with uh, 30 red belly piranha that are obviously out and about. <laughs> God, this is so cringe. It's so embarrassing. Look at my empty tank. No. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'll see you guys in the next one.